Hello, everyone. We'd like to thank you all so much for taking the time out of your weekend to attend the special 7th Annual Civil Military Relations Conference. We are obviously aware of the unfortunate circumstances that prevent us from being together yeah, in yeah. person and force us to cancel the war game component of our conference. But looking on the bright side, this year's online format has enabled us to invite participants from a wider range of universities and service academies than we'd normally be capable of. Never before in the history of Tufts Allies have we had such a geographically diverse set of attendees. We hope that this will be a positive and educational experience for all the participants who are able to make it today. That being said, let us begin. We are Tufts Alliance Thinking Leaders in Education and the Services, also known as Allies, a student-led organization at Tufts that initially began as a civil military relations club in 2006 at the very beginning of the surge in Iraq. Since then, we have expanded our role on the Tufts campus to include a broader focus on international security and geopolitics. However, we never abandoned our club's roots. This conference, seeking to unite students from civilian universities and cadets from service academies, remains as a testament to the importance we place on a healthy and functioning civil military relationship. Having covered topics as diverse as climate change, arms sales, and cybersecurity, we seek to ensure that undergraduates, whether enrolled in ROTC, at a service academy, or an involved student, are not siloed from each other. As always, we're honored that we are able to consistently bring back so many students from both civilian and military institutions to discuss the issues that face us in the 21st century. We'd also like to extend our deepest appreciations to the Institute for Global Leadership for connecting us with some of our esteemed speakers and for assisting us with the general logistics involved in running this conference. We also extend our warmest gratitude to the speakers who we have gathered today to speak about the emerging security challenges we face in outer space. And last, but certainly not least, we want to thank our two directors, Ian Kim and Israel Lee, for being the driving force for this conference. Now join us in a silent virtual round of applause for everyone who has helped make CMRC 2020 a reality. Without further ado, I welcome the directors to open up the conference. I hope you all have a great time listening to these speakers and return again next year when we'll hopefully be able to return to our previous format. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Tufts 7th Civil Military Relations Conference, Securing the Final Frontier. I'm Misra, this is Ian, and we are this year's co-directors. This year, our conference will focus on the emerging security competition in space, along with the newest branch of the US military, the Space Force. For millennia, space has captured our imaginations and represented a mythical frontier. But now that we have the ability to go there, the competition over it has intensified. The Cold War saw the beginning stages of conflict in space. And today, it is of vital importance to modern society. Satellites are crucial, not only to modern military operations, communications, weapons targeting, and intelligence collection, but also to the global internet infrastructure we rely so heavily on. Should an adversary hack or shoot down a satellite, military forces won't be able to coordinate with each other, nor use their full arsenal. Similar to the growing importance of cyber in defense and foreign policy, space will only become more involved in international affairs and national security as countries increase their capabilities and enter the space domain. While space has traditionally been dominated by global powers, more and more countries are launching their own assets to orbit and beyond. The UAE sent its first astronaut to the International Space Station last year, and China is growing its anti-satellite capabilities. Given the expanding access and use of space, recognizing the importance of this domain will be crucial to understanding current conflicts and future wars. We would like to once again thank both the students from all across the United States from attending, as well as the distinguished experts who have agreed to share their insights with us in their busy schedules. Thus, without further ado, let us begin by introducing our keynote speaker. Mr. Paul Szymanski has 46 years of experience in all fields related to space control, including policy, strategic planning, surveillance, and command and control. He has worked as a consultant for the private sector with regards to space weapon employment strategies and technology, as well as for the services to analyze government policies and international treaties concerning space. The result of his research have been briefed to all levels of government, including Congress, the National Security Council, and the Department of Defense. Today, he will be presenting an introduction to outer space warfare and will provide insights to why space plays an important role in international conflict and security. Over to you. Mr. Szymanski. Yes, uh, good morning to everybody and thanks for uh, coming in and uh, seeing my, uh, my little cubicle here. Uh, right now, uh, I'm just showing a simulation of uh, 
uh, global positioning system satellites, uh, the actual orbits, the different rings, and the uh, multicolored squares on the ground show uh, the accuracy of the signals that are coming in. And many times the uh, Air Force uh, optimizes these for particular operations that they're doing that. Let me stop that though and start into the actual briefing. And let me just verify that uh, people can see my briefing slides. Yes, we can. Yes, looks good to me. Um, so I have a lot of different pictures here uh, just for uh, user interest. I'll go over some of them, but some of them are, uh, uh, for example, this uh, image here is from the ground. Um, there's various telescopes that can look at uh, low Earth uh, orbiting uh, space objects uh, under ideal conditions, which and uh, they have all kinds of compensating uh, things like the, the actual mirrors have thousands of little actuators under them that deform the mirror based on a laser going up and coming down and looking at atmospheric distortion so that you can try to get a clearer image. But I will point out one of the kind of strategic political things uh, about space is you really don't know what's going on. You really can't image most of what you wanna see, image it in a, a, a timely manner. You cannot identify adversaries and you're not even sure what happened to your uh, space assets. Uh, many times if a satellite breaks, you can sit there and say, uh, gee, I don't know what happened. And you scratch your head and you spend several months trying to think things over. And then you make an assessment of a probability it probably was this or that. But it's not like things happening on the ground where someone drops a bomb, there's a big smoking hole in the ground and you can kind of understand who did it. And that has a lot of political international relations uh, implications. Uh, for example, um, I think, let's say if we were at war with China, you know, over Taiwan or something like that, and um, one of our satellites stops working. So you could sit there and say, well, maybe it just broke, you know, like my computer breaks sometimes. Um, maybe there were solar flares and increased radiation and it, you know, messed with the systems. Uh, maybe a uh, micrometeorite hit it. Who, you know, it's, it's hard to tell. Or maybe the Chinese decided that this satellite was important to our military operations in the Western Pacific and decided to take it out. Trouble is, is maybe it's the Russians trying to stir the pot. You're not really sure. And the indications I'm getting from uh, the, uh, I guess, the White House is that we're really not going to make any counterattacks until we understand who did it. And it's not only who did it, it's like, well, why? What is the purpose? Is it just uh, showing resolve and intent? Uh, is it just trying to take out our command and control? Is it trying to uh, degrade our GPS so our weapons aren't as accurate? There's various things that you can you know, find out. Plus, was it intentional? Maybe it was human cause, but it was accidental. So th there's a lot of uncertainty there. And I believe that makes um, space war um, kind of unstable. That and the fact that um, I don't think you can defend a satellite. You're talking about hyper velocities at, I think it's 12,000 feet per second. A pound of lead is equivalent to a pound of TNT, just in the kinetic energy. And you really can't shield the satellites. You can't really figure out, you can't shoot it down, so to speak, because the various pieces will keep coming at you. So I think it could be true that who shoots first wins, and that's a very unstable environment. 
a little bit about me. I've been playing in this area for a, a very long time. Uh, I started out in my 20s uh, working at the Pentagon for the Secretary of the Air Force. I guess this is on automatic and um, worked my way down uh, since then uh, to uh, the uh, Space and Missile Systems Center in LA and the last 26 years uh, going to uh, supporting the Air Force Research Lab in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So as a general introduction to space war, uh, and I, there's, you know, it's nice to have these uh, exciting pictures. Let me uh, go off uh, trying to do this uh, in that mode. I, I like some of these quotes because we have these pretty pictures, all oh, things blowing up and blah, blah, blah. But uh, this quote from Churchill says, well, if you take the most gallant sailor and the most intrepid airman or the most audacious soldier and you put them together in one room, what do you get? And he says, the sum of their fears. So space is kind of a psychological warfare. You really don't know what's coming off. You don't know what the intents are. You don't even know maybe who the potential adversaries are. And so it's sort of information is dominant. Uh, and it's called space surveillance or space situation awareness or space domain awareness, all these buzzwords, of course, in the military. But um, it's very hard to understand what is happening and then what should you do about it? And the other problem with uh, space is, space is mostly information. It's generating information and transmitting that information. So it's generating navigational information from GPS. It's uh, generating information, um, imagery information. It's uh, weather information and all this kind of information. And so the problem is, is what's the value of information on the battlefield? If the commander knows this versus not knowing it, how does that affect the battlefield? So it, you're really talking about information warfare when you're talking about space. And your ally, your adversaries might have a different interpretation of the value of space, both to themselves and to us. So for example, they might attack some satellite of ours and do great effort. It takes a lot of effort. You use up a lot of fuel and stuff like that. And then we might sit there and scratch our head and say, oh, gee, I don't know why they took that out. We weren't particularly using it. It was just a scientific satellite, you know. And you're not really sure why they did it, and what's the purpose, what's the intent, and what our response should be. And then ultimately, how do you define winning a space war? The one who killed the most satellites? Um, probably not. Um, it's conceivable both sides would think they won the space war afterwards. And then the other problem is, is if you're doing things like blowing things up, you know, in space and all that, I think space is very political. Even though the probability of killing someone in space is very low, uh, you're not going to be attacking the International Space Station. All these satellites are just robots, essentially. I think there's a certain political, almost instability in people's minds of, oh my gosh, you had space weapons and you did space war and all that. And there might be large political realignments afterwards. You might lose some allies. If you lose the space war, you the adversary might gain some of your allies and so forth. So I think even though you might uh, see tactical engagements in space, oh, we're gonna take out this one satellite. Because space is global, everything you do there is strategic and global and highly political. So why would you do space war to begin with? And I think what you, you know, experience tells me, and I've, you know, read over the last 50 years, many books on military warfare. I have a personal library of 3000 volumes. And the, um, I think essentially a war, uh, well, this is an interesting, this quote, and this is from the second century BC, 
uh, a Greek historian. He says, it's not the object uh, objective of war to annihilate those who have given provocation for it, but to cause them to mend their ways. So it's the best way to influence people. But the whole point is war is between human minds. And I don't care how technological your equipment is, it's still something that um, your adversary commander, uh, you're trying to influence him, you're trying to work against his knowledge, his experience, his culture, his fears, and so forth. So even though you've got these billion dollar satellites and, and things like that, you're really talking about uh, reaching out and touching someone else's mind and trying to influence them. And so the way you do that is you employ specific military equipment and soldiers and sailors and Marines and so forth. And you transmit your intent, resolve and will on each other. Uh, and I like this other quote from uh, Trotsky and he's saying, well, you might not be interested in war but war ultimately is interested in you. So if you sit there and say, oh, I don't want war in space. Oh, boy, and you put your head in the sand. Well, there's all kinds of countries building anti-satellite weapons, ASATs, and they're gonna bite you sooner or later, whether you want to recognize it or not. War is interested in you, whether it's on the ground or in space. And because of that, and because of potential adversaries, uh, are developing all kinds of space weapons and things like that. We can't sit there and do nothing about it. We got to do something about it. And I'll point out that war in space doesn't necessarily mean blowing things up and creating debris. I'll go over some of the other principles, but there's all kinds of ways of messing with your adversary's systems. And I guess one of the biggest uh, techniques is cyber war. Now, I, I actually have a little bit of a problem about cyber war in that I, I have this thought experiment. And I said, well, you have this soldier on the battlefield in the trench, and this egghead shows up with this small black box with a big red button in the center. And he says, if you push that button, I assure you that tank coming at you will stop. There'll be some sort of cyber war thing that would stop its systems. However, you can either carry this black box or carry a bazooka, but you can't have both. What do you want? And so the soldier is gonna be sitting there and say, well, this enemy tank just crushed my friend yesterday. I uh, bet for the big smoking hole in the ground, it's much more satisfying. And I know I got it versus this red button that claims it will stop the uh, tank and maybe it'll reboot and 30 seconds later, come crush me. So. Cyber war sounds great. It sounds relatively clean because even a cyber attack can mess up a satellite too. It starts blowing up or something like that. Yeah, I got a bunch of all the quotes. I don't know if you guys have access to these briefings. You can uh, go through all that, but this is kind of the situation uh, for space. And starting at the very top, there's various ways of satellites to stop working. I mean, much like things stop working on the ground. And uh, you've got solar weather. You can have uh, all kinds of increases in solar storm that sends more particles and then the satellites um, stop working or they're intermittent, things like that. Uh, and by satellites, I mean, you've got communication satellites, you've got surveillance satellites so looking at the ground and that could be uh, visible imagery or radar. Um, these are some of the intelligence things that so you're maybe looking at signals, um, seeing that, oh, it looks like they're prepping for war. There's increased signals at this depot or something like that. You've got, uh, it's called early warning. And that is, oh my gosh, they just launched a bunch of ICBMs at us. We could see the flashes on the ground and track the missiles. So, and then you've got the uh, GPS and things like that. And then you've got a whole ground network uh, controlling the satellites and even starting out at the parts suppliers and satellite manufacturers and things like that. And all of these are vulnerable nodes that you can uh, attack the satellite system. It's a whole system, not only the satellite, but the communications on the ground, the controllers. Um, you could maybe insert 
some cyber code in parts that uh, are going to go into the satellite months later. Um, you can do cyber attacks against command centers and satellite control centers, or you could do direct attacks against the satellite itself. So you could have maybe a cyber anti-satellite that would inject code uh, into the uh, spacecraft. The latest in thing, and everyone on the block has to have them, and that is an inspector satellite. And uh, the Russians have them, the Chinese have them, we have them. And the thing with uh, inspector satellites is uh, it's really nice to get up and close, you know, within maybe a couple hundred meters um, and see what that satellite really is all about. Does it have um, hidden war reserve modes? Uh, are there doors in it that something comes out, a space mine and things like that? However, while you're there, and this is kind of like the maintenance satellite, which you know NASA and different companies are developing, where oh we get really close within inches of a satellite, and maybe you're replacing damaged parts and electronic boxes and things like that. Well, while you're there, if you've got a maintenance satellite with manipulator arms, to my mind, this is like having a satellite in a wheelbarrow and and wheeling it into your garage and going at it. Like, well, let me drill a hole here. Let me cut this wire. Let me saw this off. Let me bend this. Let me paint a sensor and, and things like that. You can do all kinds of mean little things uh, to the satellite. And then you have other uh, means. You have uh, laser anti-satellites. This is mostly from the ground at the moment, though the trouble is with a ground laser, it takes a long time for the satellite to come over. It can't be clouds and rain and things like that. Space space in some sense is better, but well, I tell you, that's got to be a real hum humongous laser up there. And it's uh, got to, you know, have a lot of uh, uh, support, you know, fuel and things like that. And then it's a very juicy target uh, for your adversary. So I, to my knowledge, there's no plans to have some big space base battle laser or something like that. Now, what's the history of space war? Well, it's funny. It goes all the way back to ancient Roman times. Uh, Lucian's uh, true history of 175 AD, almost 2000 years ago, uh, had a, a, a war on the moon where Roman legions went there. And I guess they had spiders attacking them and things like that. I don't know. I, I didn't really read it. And then going to the 1950s, you had these concepts of space battle uh, you know, stars, I guess, uh, attacking satellites. And this, you know, satellites had just been launched a year earlier in 1957. We've had three or four different programs in the 60s of uh, nuclear uh, weapons to attack satellites, uh, direct hit uh, going all the way to the 1980s. That's a program I worked on, the F-15A set, where it actually did blow up a satellite in, in the test. If you go back to the, like the 1970s, the Russians had an anti-aircraft cannon on their Almaz spacecraft, and they actually shot it a few times. And it sounds complicated, but in a sense, it's still following the same arcs of gravity uh, that you would on Earth with an artillery shell or something. I'm not sure, again, if some spacecraft is coming at you and you shoot an anti-tank round or anti-aircraft round at it and then make it into small pieces and then all those small pieces are still essentially coming at you. So I don't know if you've done your job. Uh, another Russian uh, concept was uh, what's called a kinetic kill vehicle, KKV. And uh, essentially uh, you know that a satellite's coming over you in a few minutes, you launch it beforehand uh, from the ground and it catches up with you and then it blows up all these pellets when it's close by and hopes a few of the pellets hit the satellite. And that was operational for uh, several years. Uh, I guess in some sense, it's kind of similar to the F-15 ASAT, only this thing wasn't pellets. It was essentially a coffee can that had a seeker that supposedly was really good at you know, maneuvering and uh, hit the satellite directly. Um, that never went operational as far as I can tell. 
And then uh, there's various uh, Russian anti-satellite concepts. You can just see those online. Uh, here again is in a, like a space plane attacking a satellite and lasers and so forth. And then there's various means of attacking space systems. And during Desert Storm in 91, uh, there was a bunch of what was called heavy earth terminals. You, know, you, you can imagine these huge uh, dishes that are communicating with satellites. And this one was in Iraq, you know, a very juicy target with uh, iron bombs to go and take it out. And that's space warfare. And let me show you another kind of space warfare, I guess in a few charts. Um, now, what has happened in the past? In the 1960s, and uh, it was like, I think the 80s, I went to the uh, uh, Laurel, Maryland satellite station run by the uh, Federal Communications Commission, and they monitor interference of um, satellites, you know, uh, accidental interference. And the head told me about an incident where uh, the ComSat satellite was getting jammed for a few days. And they maneuver the satellite back and forth to see the source of the jamming, you know, to see what's the strongest signal. And it was off the uh, east coast of the United States. And they figured it was some Russian trawler jamming it. Not sure why. Was that accidental or intentional? I would think intentional if it went on for days. Another thing, CSAT, um, sat out that went up in the uh, 1970s to measure sea height. You know, sounds uh, har harmless enough. And when I first started my career in my 20s, I had a NASA employee tell me that they got, they were shocked to find out at NASA that when we're, they were measuring sea height, they noticed that they could see submarines uh, at operating depth deep in the ocean, because even though they were deep, I guess they were disturbing the, uh, the waves slightly at the surface. I mean, I, I did analyses of uh, the SPOT system. It was the French uh, imagery satellite that we worried about in Desert Storm. Uh, it would be able to see the, uh, I knew the uh, head of uh, military intelligence for Schwarzkopf and he said, they purposely put the French uh, forces on the leftmost of the left hook to be the most in danger so that they would turn off that imagery satellite. And I analyzed it. And even though the um, imagery satellites, the resolution was 10 meters, you can see telephone cables or, or power cables in our rock uh, because of even though they're only maybe a few inches wide, they're miles long. And so this is the same thing with CSAT detecting um, sea height in submarines. Now, oh my gosh, you've just negated one third of the uh, American triad uh, to be able to see where those submarines are and where they're going, you know, just be a line in the ocean. So according to this NASA guy, um, they purposely turned off the sea stat and faked its death uh, because it was it is probably was the most significant satellite in the sky uh, at the time. Later on, surveillance types, and they do radar imagery of satellites, and the radar imagery shows sea stat all messed up. It's all bent out of shape, and it just seems to me satellites just generally don't get bent out of shape. I think it was attacked and blown up. Uh, it was just too sensitive to sell. And I don't know who did it, but uh, it's suspicious, let's say. Another suspicious thing in the 1980s, there was one year where uh, all kinds of launches failed. Both American and Russian launches of satellites in space just kept failing one after the other after the other. And it almost looked like a tit for tat we're taking theirs out, we're, they're taking ours out. And see, that's the thing with space. You can do all kinds of things without the general public knowing you're doing it to show resolve and intent to an adversary. And I'll go over that, what happened uh, later in that. 
uh, in the 2000 teens, uh, there was a definite space war. Can't talk about it. It's classified. I have a whole briefing on the uh, 2014 over the, uh, well, the Ukrainian conflict. And it appears that suddenly the Russian GLONASS satellites, these are the GPS equivalents, stopped working. And I can mathematically prove that we attacked it. That uh, every time a GLONASS satellite came over uh, Alice Springs in Australia, which is a known NSA listening site, it blanked out. And they started blanking out like at 6.30 in the morning. And I know these guys, you know, come to work at six, get your coffee, do some test runs, and at 6.30, start attacking these Russian GLONASS satellites. And they started blinking out in numerical order. You know, if there were several satellites in view at the time, be GLONASS one, two, and three. I mean, it obviously was intentional. And that's a space war that we actually lost. And this is this concept of war is more than just soldiers fighting and things like that. It's a very political kinds of thing. Again, you know, looking at intent, trying to change an adversary's will and so forth. And so the reason we lost it is, um, it was obvious to me that the American banking system was attacked. And you'll see there was a, for about a week, uh, there was a, in the open press, a, a, a lot of uh, stories about five major banks in New York City had a cyber attack and millions of uh, bank accounts and uh, stock accounts and all were downloaded. And they said, boy, it looks like it's coming from Russian servers. And then he didn't hear anything about it. And suddenly uh, President Obama stop talking negatively about the Russians and the uh, uh, Ukrainian conflict. And a week later, everyone was at the uh, negotiating table. All the players says, okay, we've had enough. The space thing bothered us enough. And let's negotiate kind of a temporary peace. I don't know if it really was a peace, but it's been going on for a few years now. And so the Russians, couldn't win in space, but then they won on the ground. And so they attacked the cyber uh, attack on these accounts and then nothing happened. The accounts didn't show up online and things like that. It obviously was an extortion uh, kind of a attempt. And we went on with our lives. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other attacks that happened. You know, things like um, the Russians launched a uh, communication satellite, YML, I think it was, to be able to cover the uh, Eastern Ukraine and mysteriously, the launch vehicle crashed on a Chinese village when Putin was in China selling uh, space technology. Circumstantial, I can't prove that. Okay, and then the final straw, so to speak, is uh, something really bad happened in the last few years, maybe three to four years. Uh, really bad in space. Several people have told me that. I no longer have clearances because I'm retired. They timed out. But they told me that happened. They couldn't tell me what. But it's obvious to me, you know, being in this field 46 years, usually there's two, three job announcements a year uh, for these kinds of space warfare uh, jobs. Now there's hundreds, if not thousands. You can see there's like five and a half billion dollars more on the space warfare budget the open budget, not even the covert budget. I can tell that the US government is panicking like crazy because they probably really lost a, another space war. And another indicator of that is the, um, you know, Congress has been very much divided as we all know. They can't pass any sort of legislation, but mysteriously there is bipartisan support for the space force. Nobody complained. They must have been briefed on what happened. Everyone says, geez, I guess we really better do something about this. And suddenly, magically, we have the Space Force. So those are the few wars that I kind of know about and assume and assess. Now, I'm getting a little more into the subtleties, into the politics. Uh, the military uh, does a lot of thought, both on the ground and hopefully starting to do some thought about space. Of, you know, you just don't go and blow things up. And there's different ways of 
attacking. And those ways are called disrupt, deny, degrade, destroy, delay, deceive, whatever. They're all Ds. I got like 20 Ds like that. But disrupt means you temporarily and partially impair the system of a satellite. So uh, jamming is temporary. You jam for a few hours, you stop it. You jam only a certain frequency, and so you're only jamming one channel of the communication satellite and letting the other channels through. Because quite frankly, a lot of these satellites carry um, communications from different countries around the world you know, on a, you know, messed with the rest of the world. And then deny is the temporary but full elimination of the whole satellite. So you um, make it start spinning. And so the antenna is not pointed to the earth anymore. And it takes some days and not weeks to recover the satellite. The other is the permanent and partial impairment. So permanent means we shot a laser beam right up at sensor, uh, but we only took out a few pixels. We didn't take out the whole sensor. So it's kind of blinded a little bit. It's permanent, but it's partial versus Oh, we took a laser and we cut the satellite in half, you know, on that. And then there's various infrawar things. You delay it, you deceive people, you send up false information. Uh, maybe one satellite channel has false information and the good information, you delay that information so the false one gets through. I mean, there's all kinds of things you can play uh, with that. Now, what's unique about space that's kind of different from the ground? And I mentioned before, space is global. Even if you're doing tactical actions against a particular satellite, it has global implications. I mean, if you create a debris field, it could affect 100 other satellites in the same orbit. Um, and then I mentioned before, it's highly political. Uh, we haven't really had a space war that people know about, but um, I think we've had a lot of space wars. Uh, I think space is like the Cold War in the 1960s and 70s where you'd have Russian destroyers coming close to our destroyers and somehow at times accidentally hitting them and you know pushing the envelope and and probing and you know U-2 uh, aircraft being shot down and I think that's probably happening now with the inspector satellites and maybe some jamming cyber attacks and things like that sort of probing the defenses and the other thing is is you can do a heck of a lot in space. I mean, I mentioned the uh, GLONASS attacks, and you know, people didn't really know about that, even though it was publicly announced. Oh, the GLONASS stopped working. We said, oh yeah, those Russian satellites, whatever. Um, but uh, a long time later, a GPS satellite failed in the same manner, and I've never seen one fail that way. But it failed the same way that the uh, GLONASS ones did. And people say, oh, yeah, that was just uh, you know, a failure. We knew it was going to happen. You know, they always can make an excuse. And you, since you don't have smoking holes in the ground, uh, and you know, I was a professional liar for 27 years. I did uh, covert systems. And by professional liar, I mean cover stories. And it's called the onion theory. And you have a cover story on one skin of the onion. And if that gets blown, there's another one underneath and then another, another. And there's people who've devoted their whole lives to systems that are just cover stories for the real thing. And so there, yeah, well, you could readily imagine governments lie, especially in the security uh, field. And so you never really know what's true and what really happened. And it's very easy to convince the public, oh yeah, that didn't really happen. So, um, and I'm mentioning wartime actions have potential peacetime consequences. So I mentioned space debris. Uh, gee, I don't know if we have to rewrite uh, outer space treaties uh, if after a war. And just as an aside too, I didn't realize until this year, you know, people talk about the outer space treaty, you're not supposed to have weapons of mass destruction. In anti-satellites, nah, not mass destruction, but they were, you know, in the 1960s, when they made this treaty, they were talking nuclear weapons and things like that. And things like, oh, you can't claim ownership of the moon and celestial bodies and all that. Well, there's over 80 countries that never signed the Outer Space Treaty. So if some, uh, uh, let's say, uh, these commercial entrepreneurs that are building launch vehicles, 
if you would um, shift your launch vehicle from one of those countries, launch it from there and land on the moon and plant a flag and say, now we own the moon. You know, I, I'm not enough of a lawyer, but why cannot? And the way China operates lately, even though they're a signatory to the treaty, it appears to me that 10 minutes before one of their astronauts land on the moon, they can say, ah, we abrogate the treaty. We don't care about it anymore. Now we own the moon, <laughs> you know? And so it'd just be like the Western hemisphere was discovered by the Spanish, what, 500 years ago or something. And um, they claimed ownership of the whole thing, but claims are one thing, you know, a military might and colonies and all is another taking over. So for what that's worth. Um, the other thing about space is uh, you, uh, you can't maneuver much. You have to really figure out where a space war is gonna be, a, a different region. So you know, going back to my earlier scenario in the West Pacific, we're you know, fighting it out. So satellites that kind of cover the Western Pacific, and I'm talking about maybe geosynchronous uh, orbit, communications, uh, weather satellites, you cannot maneuver satellites from the Atlantic area to the Pacific. I mean, you can, but it's going to take weeks and months and, and so forth and take up a lot of fuel. So if you're going to do a war, in my calculations are space war is over within 24 hours. Uh, if you're going to do a war, you got to do it with what you have in hand at the moment in the immediate area. So you have to kind of figure out where that war is going to be. And also that has international implications for allies. If you've got, oh, uh, the European Union is our ally in space. You know, I don't know if that's true yet, but uh, you know, they're getting there. Well, they mostly have satellites that are gonna cover Europe and the satellites covering Europe aren't gonna do you much good in the Pacific. So allies might claim they're on our side, but maybe you're alone ultimately uh, when it comes down to just the physics of orbits and maybe uh, international political considerations that they really don't want to go there, so to speak. The other thing about uh, space is it's not what you really think and believe in terms of um, getting from point A to B. Well, uh, the Apollo astronauts, when they were trying to rendezvous with the capsules and you know things like that, They'd say, well, it's over there. Let me step on the gas and go towards it, you know, and increase my velocity. Well, the trouble is if you increase your velocity, you go higher in orbit. So you actually go away from it. So it's kind of counterintuitive how you maneuver around. And, you know, a lot of people as fantasies, oh, I'm in this space plane and maneuvering around and I got a steering wheel and all, which is probably BS because you can't do the calculations in your head of the orbital dynamics. You can't do them fast enough. You're going to have computers uh, figure out all of that. And there's consequences to that, too. You might have your precious, very valuable satellite in an orbit. And then there's adversary has another satellite that's kind of in the same altitude and inclination, but it's on the other side of the Earth. And you might think, oh, oh that's fine. I, it's not a threat. Well, no, it is a threat. It's very easy to maneuver if you're already in the same altitude and inclination uh, to just to phase the orbits and come at you. So in a sense, a situation math, those two things are very close together. Okay, how much time do I have? I know I'm probably beyond my original allotment of 30 minutes. You have do you want you me have to a few more minutes. On? Um, probably just okay. a few more minutes to close up. Okay. Okay, let me at least do two more charts and it goes into how do you attack space systems? And remember use this term systems, not necessarily the satellite. There's all kinds of diplomatic and economic means. Um, you know, your country, some adversary country is starting to develop an anti-satellite program. Well, you can do is, uh, you know, uh, diplomatic means saying to try to get them to stop. Like, well, if you do that, you can't join the World Bank or, you know, all kinds of things like that. 
Um, you might uh, do an embargo of uh, technologies and parts that they might be do using to build it. So that's space warfare on the ground pre-conflict. I mentioned all kinds of the cyber things where, you know, outright jamming. Um, you can spoof the satellite. Uh, you can make it start spinning maybe, or you could uh, make it turn uh, all the satellites in order to get uh, rid of heat, there's no air out there. They have to radiate out to the deep space. We'll make a, the radiator, the satellite turn around so the radiator is pointing towards the a sun or something like that. And the satellite would overheat and just die. Doesn't blow up necessarily or anything. Uh, there's been some thought of maybe, you know, since the satellite is not really an intelligent AI robot, you can hijack it and use it for yourself. Uh, change the codes and access codes and things like that. And when I've going back to the um, incident uh, in 2014 with the uh, Ukrainian conflict and the attacking the American banking system, one of the banks was uh, Mellon Bank, and they spend $250 million a year in uh, cyber defense. And the thing goes here is like, well, you have a country attacking a company. The company's always going to lose. <laughs> you know, the co a country has so many assets and they're so much more clever than you, let's say. Uh, the cyber will always get through. And I've seen this and people saying, oh, we're invulnerable. You know, this is going to happen. And, and they're fooling themselves, especially in warfare. When you're about to die, you get very clever. And there's always a way, one way or the other. Um, you can induce the satellite to burn up its reserve fuel. And, and let me go over some of these things. Uh, this uh, little yellow giant here, it's actually very small, uh, was a high powered microwave uh, sticky bomb proposed uh, for terrestrial systems, but it proposed for uh, satellites. Stick it on, leave it there, maybe you know, imbalance the satellites, maybe leave it in a nearby orbit. And when you push a button, the satellite, poof. There's a lot of ground-based lasers. Here's uh, one that's uh, outside Albuquerque, New Mexico. Not a killer laser, but, you know, could be. There's little various blinding lasers. Now blinding it, this is a picture of what a, a sensor looking at the ground gets blinded. Of course, it gets blinded right there and not necessarily outside the direct laser thing. Um, there's all kinds of, uh, we mentioned laser A stats and things like that. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for the fascinating briefing on space warfare. At least for me, uh, Mr. Szymanski, at least for me, one of the interesting points of your presentation was that space warfare is very global and highly political and that even though most of the time the targets are satellites rather than human soldiers, there's still um, a lot of consequences to one's actions. So we're now going to move on to the Q&A session. And so um, attendees, if you have a question, you can go to the Q&A box at the bottom right of your screen and type in a question. Um, and so I'm going to start this um, Q&A session with the question. And so you're um, ending with talking about how like sort of um, businesses and commercial systems are affected in a space conflict. And so I was wondering that in a space conflict, it's clear that militaries will try to protect their space assets, but um, it seems like businesses and commercial assets will be much more vulnerable. Do you think that militaries will be able to protect commercial assets or will these assets mostly be left on their own in a space war? I think uh, I've been to 15 different military exercises. And when the commercial operators showed up, they had this fantasy that they'd be protected. <laughs> but I don't know how. You know, for example, um, military satellites, uh, some of them go up with uh, anti jam capabilities. Well, a commercial satellite's not going to spend extra money, weight, power, volume to put that in there. And so how is the military supposed to stop somebody jamming the satellites besides, oh, looking, this is where the jammer is, let's drop an iron bomb on it, you know. But that takes hours and maybe days or something. And 
you know, if you're doing something, the whole point is space is not there for itself. It's there to support the ground. And so if it's supporting some sort of conflict happening on the ground. And if you want to jam a satellite, you want to deny the ground forces the ability to use it. Now, you want to deny it for a specific operation happening on the ground for a matter of hours and days. And so even if they take out the jammer, ultimately, um, maybe you've done it your mission, you know, uh, denying that capability. But, and then, and then you could have a hundred different jammers all around the country that go on for a few milliseconds and off, and then another one on and off and all. And it's continuously being jammed, but it's hard to track who's doing what, you know. But getting back to commercial, a lot of people don't realize that, uh, for example, the, um, the UAVs, the uh, drones that were dropping bombs on in Afghanistan and so forth, they're controlled outside of Las Vegas in a military base there. And they're controlled via satellite. You know, beam is bounced off from Afghanistan to a satellite at geosynchronous and been bounced back maybe a few times, ultimately to this uh, air base, Creech, I think it is, in Las Vegas. What satellites do they use? They use commercial satellites. They use Intelsat, at least a few years ago, I know it was Intelsat, international satellite with all kinds of countries associated with it. Now, I'm not a space lawyer, but it appears to me that Intelsat and the people and the controllers on the ground, maybe in France or someplace else, are part of the kill chain and a legal target. So does that mean uh, some adversary can go blow up a ground station in France over the fact that they're blowing up targets in Iraq or somewhere else. Uh, and so this is the kind of the, the international nature of space. You, you can't just make it one country in one region. You know, oh, I'm gonna deny an adversary's ability to download images of the battlefield well, how do you do it? He could download it in 50 different countries around the world. You're gonna have 50 different jammers. And what are those countries gonna think of you jamming where you're at? You're gonna have anti-satellites sitting on a ship outside the country trying to shoot it. I mean, I don't know how you do all that. Does that answer the question? Yes. Um, yeah, I think it shows how global it is given how many different steps there are in the supply chain. Right. Um, I have a question from the audience. Uh, from Mira, who says, you spoke about how existing space treaties are easily violated with 80 countries not even signed on. How do you think space law is going to develop in the future? There's um, a whole world out there. There's two worlds. Uh, you go to the labs and they are developing space systems, you know, and moving along, and they're kind of a little bit classified. And, um, and then there's companies doing that, and there's politicians in Congress who are passing budgets for that, and there's that whole world. And then that's called the overt world. And then there's the covert world. And space has been very covert for decades. And I've been on programs that routinely violate international treaties and national laws. And they go and they get away with it. <laughs> so you can have all kinds of treaties that you like. And you could get a treaty and say, oh, we, you're not supposed to have space weapons. Well, what about these maintenance satellites? You know, are they a space weapon? You know, they can tear apart a satellite. How do we, you know, regulate that? Uh, what if there's this Russian space cannon deep inside the satellite or something? You know, how do you know that? Uh, are you going to inspect these things? You're going to have some UN super duper cruiser with all kinds of fuel. It's probably 90% fuel going around orbits, taking years, lo looking at satellites and taking x-rays or something, you know? None of this is practical. And so, okay, it feels good to put these treaties down on paper and people say all kinds of things that, oh yeah, we don't want weapons in space. And at the same time that, yeah, they've been developing for years. So 
good luck, guys. <laughs> That's all I could say. Yeah, it seems like any sort of space agreement or treaty would be just so difficult to implement in practice. I have another question from the audience. Um, who at, um, I have Colin who asks, is there a legitimacy to fears of terrestrial weapons being placed in space and being used in the future? For example, a space to earth nuclear launch system or kinetic weapon? The Russians had uh, FOBs, Fractional Orbital Bombardment System, 60s, 70s probably. And the Inter Outer Space Treaty says you can't have weapons of mass destruction in orbit. Well, it only went into partial orbit, it didn't go into full orbit. So supposedly it didn't violate treaties. Uh, we have all these uh, do, I don't know if it's still uh, early warning systems in the northern part, you know, Alaska and all that to detect missiles coming from Russia over. Well, this came from the south. So those are weapons of mass destruction. I uh, was on, I did some of the original analyses of space to earth weapons in the 1980s, went up to the, the presidential level. And the, um, they were very effective. Now, what we were trying to figure was um, some sort of weapon like you put on an A-10 that kills tanks or something like that. And so it was a, a wide area anti-armor munitions, wham, or something like that. And we would put these on, um, well, it was uh, RAS-V, reusable aerodynamic space vehicle. So the things that we're starting to see now, like with the X-37B, where it takes off from the ground, is in space and then flies back. Well, it could drop off some munitions. And the way we thought about it was they would drop them off to the same initial conditions that an A-10 would have dropped it off. You know, you use a re-entry vehicle, but then you'd be able to be dropping things anywhere on earth, maybe 40 to 60 minutes later. So you had control of the whole earth or something, you know, but, uh, the, um, of course, we always uh, refight old wars. And back then in the 80s, I was refighting, uh, well, we we're looking at uh, a NATO conflict. And it was very effective in that um, most of our aircraft were destroyed in the ground the first day of the war. But this was inside the United States, this bomber. And it could go there and come back with impunity, so to speak. So a lot of that is very effective. Now, did we actually go and do it? I remember uh, an important space general arbitrarily being transferred to uh, the airframe world. And then we have, uh, you know, these stories of Aurora aircraft in uh, California, supersonic somethings and all that we've heard for decades and all. So, you know, they, the Air Force can have all kinds of programs that you're not aware of. So it, it could be true already. Now, nukes from space, I don't know. Is there an advantage? I'd have to think about it. I know um, years ago they were saying, well, why are, isn't the military putting uh, bases on the moon? And the military says, why would we? You know, it takes days to get back. What does it do? What's the purpose? So what's the purpose of these kind of nuclear delivery means since we got some pretty good ones already with bombers and uh, missiles and submarines and all that. Is there any real advantage? But for conventional attack, now it's very expensive, though I saw an analysis a few weeks ago of um, delivering packages from space, you know, there via, you know, rockets going up and things like that. So I don't know about the economics of that, but, you know, many times when you got to get a bomb someplace, like, um, the Phoenix missiles that we gave to the Shah of Iran, was that 70s? And suddenly the Shah fell and we had these very sensitive missiles. And, uh, you know, having this bomber take them out 40 minutes later would have been really nice. So there's, you know, some specialized things, I think, for that. I have another question from the audience from Zoe who says, is NATO prepared to launch multilateral space operations specifically within the context of Article 5, where member countries are expected to come to one another's defense in case of an attack? Yeah, just in the last six months, they've been talking about that. They're still scratching their head. 
I think they've come out with some tepid policy things, but I, I think they're still working that. Um, you know, does NATO come to our defense if there's a war uh, over Taiwan? I don't think so. Um, in Africa, um, maybe. I mean, they've been sending, I don't know if it's NATO people, but individual countries have been sending things to the uh, Iran and our, not Iran, Iraq and uh, Afghanistan, weren't they? And also, there's some feeling, feelers going out. But I assure you, they're way behind the United States in terms of thought processes on space war. And so they're just sort of gearing up. The Space Force inspired them. Um, I would think the French are probably the most ahead and then maybe the Germans when it comes to uh, space warfare thinking. Kind of adding on to that question, um, what? Do you know about the capabilities of other NATO members besides the United States? Um, like you mentioned, France and Germany seem to be more advanced. Do you think that they would have enough capability to actually be helpful or are they not really, do they not really have very many space assets in the first place? France does have a lot of uh, signals intelligence uh, satellites. As a matter of fact, um, uh, anyone can download the satellite catalog that shows where all the space objects are, satellites and dead items. And a few years back, the French complained that we were publishing the locations of their sensitive classified signals intelligence satellites, and that if we didn't stop it, they'd start publishing ours. <laughs> you know, So I think we probably did stop publishing it and all that. So they think they're important enough. I mean, signals intelligence, I would think, is very important um, and could help support. They certainly would help support us for a war in Europe. Elsewhere, you know, is again, is there, you know, France, uh, oh, we have colonies in Africa. And so we'll, you know, help in that area, but we don't, well, maybe they care about uh, Vietnam and all, but it just, it, you know, depends on their political alignments. And I think, uh, you know, I did a, a, a study where um, I had my orbital dynamics software and I took a hundred random objects in space and said, go attack these other hundred random objects and it calculate all the Delta V fuel and things like that. And 96% of them met the other object in 24 hours. So to me, those were ASAT attacks. Um, you know, they met the same orbit. Um, to me, the war is over with in 24 hours. And if we sit there and say, oh, we're not going to, you know, uh, counterattack until we know who attacked us and we're going to get our allies on board and they're going to scratch their heads and say, you sure? And what exactly happened? Maybe it was a meteorite and, you know, they're going to, I think we're all going to self deter <laughs> and the war will be over with, you know, and we'll say, oh, we don't know. We're good guys. We're more authoritarian regimes don't really care about public opinion, you know. And let me get back to some of the qualities of space. Um, one is uh, attribution. You want to make sure if you're doing these kinds of attacks, it can't be attributed back to you. The other thing is uh, make it so that the adversary doesn't even know he's under attack. Maybe, like the Russian thing when we attacked the GLONASS, it was done kind of stupidly. Why was it done on one location where anyone with orbital dynamic software, which you can download for free, you can download the catalog for free, could have done the same thing I did to say, uh, the Russians published the exact date and time that it happened. So you could say, well, where are those satellites at that date and time? Oh, gee, they're all over Australia. Well, these cyber weapons, our suitcase size nowadays. They could be in embassies around the world. They could be on ships at sea. You could have attacked them from five, 10 different locations around the world and no one would have known, except you're trying to send a message. So you wanna make sure they receive the message. <laughs> so you can't be too obscure about it, I guess. I don't know if I got an off subject, but. No, that makes sense. Um, yeah. I have another question from the audience who asks, what are the consequences of losing a space war? Yeah, that's important. And 
you can even back up from that is um, how do you define losing a space war? And I have briefings on what are surrender criteria. And the uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff have uh, Joint Pub 5-0, which is this is how you conduct war. And it's actually kind of a genius thing. It says, um, before you even start thinking about blowing things up, you have to list what are the surrender criteria to stop the conflict. And then you back it off from there. Well, how do we achieve those surrender criteria? So I conceive that both sides might think they won the war because how do you define, I mean, on the ground, a terrestrial systems, uh, you know, let's say uh, Saddam Hussein, okay, we depose them, we gain territory, we destroy the military gear, you know, there's realignments, political, you could have all these kind of definitions of, yeah, we won, but in space, uh, is there really territory? Um, do we really have to take out uh, space leaders? Um, you know, uh, do we define it of, uh, we've reduced his ASAT capabilities 50%. And that's good enough, you know? So, okay, it's ill-defined. And then let's say, okay, we defined it and the whole world knows we lost. I think the consequence, well, first of all, there's consequences on the ground. I think an adversary knows enough from even from Desert Storm, which supposedly was the first space war, so to speak. They know how important space is to the conduct of our operations. I mean, think about it. You have a, a naval carrier battle group in the Western Pacific, um, how does it communicate back to the United States via satellite? You know, it's not, I don't know if they practice triple scatter comm anymore, you know, on things. Okay, they're launching uh, attack aircraft off the deck. What if we don't have GPS? Uh, is it even worth launching them if they can't accurately hit their targets and they're risking their lives and and things like that. So the adversaries know space is very important to us. So if they were smart, and I'm sure they are, they would attack our space assets before they even start on the ground. And that's interesting. That's strategic indicators because space is not a continuous kind of thing. You've got a satellite in one orbit uh, and you want to attack a satellite in another orbit, you can't just start thrusting any old time during the orbit. There's only specific times that orbits you got to st start thrusting. So you have to optimize your attack and you have to place your attacking anti-satellites in certain key choke points. So if an adversary wants to take out a significant portion of our space capabilities before conflict on the ground, he's got to pre-position these assets and he's got to start thrusting and it might take hours or even days to get to where he wants to get to. Now, if we had good space intelligence, good radars and uh, optical systems, and we were smart, you know, we understood these choke points and things like that, we could detect him setting up for an attack on space. And we might be able to prevent the war from starting on the ground at all by going to the UN and say, hey, you're about to attack us in space, what's up, you know, and frustrate his ability, you know, to even take out our space systems. And he's gonna say, damn, I'm not gonna even try it on the ground now. So space does have some interesting conflict escalation and treaty implications. But I do believe if we lost, we would have, uh, we might very well lose the uh, war on the ground. And I, I think they've simulated this in some of the military exercises. They called a day without space. And so they're all worried about that. I mean, why are we worried about, why do we have a space force? You know, why are we worried that we're gonna lose our satellites? They must think that's very significant. So we would lose on the ground if they're able to take us out early. And then I think there's a whole implication afterwards of um, some allies might say, damn, you guys created all this space debris. I don't want to be your ally anymore, you know? Or, well, we thought, U.S., you were big and strong, but you really suck. Uh, we're going over to China's sphere of influence, especially since they're in our backyard, you know, and you don't have space now to bring those carriers over. And, think, I, you know, I think there'd be realignments. I think there'd be a political thing of, oh, we really need new treaties now. We're really mad about what you did. And we're going to try to restrict this. And I think 
when you're doing war planning in space, you have to set out what are your goals before you even start. And then you have to figure out, well, gee, we're not going to go wild in space because we have to understand what the consequences are post-conflict. How is the world going to look like after what we just did in space? And I don't think any of these Space Force people are thinking any of this stuff. I know these guys. Uh, see, the trouble with the Air Force is, when's the last time uh, the air war was in doubt in all the wars we've been in? And I would say that be early days of World War II. <laughs> you know, no one alive today had a really bad time and really had to think things through and really was under pressure. And we always win in the air. And it's all these Air Force people or Space Force now. And I just worried about the culture and the attitudes and the thought processes that, uh, you know, you look at uh, Strategic Air Command when they were bombing uh, North Vietnam, they would uh, go in, this, in and out in the same routes every time. So the North Vietnamese would just set up their SAMs right along there. I mean, they, they didn't have the thought of tactical, their strategic war mentality, you know, we only went in once and dropped the nukes. So they're, they're really, uh, the services think different and different countries think different. So that's why I think we really ought to have the, the, all the other services on early on, our, uh, Army and Navy and all that into the Space Force before the culture set. And we really ought to have allies come in because they have an entirely different viewpoints you know, the NATO and, you know, Japan or, and all that, maybe even India, uh, to come in on these discussions and, and bring in their two cents, because this is all new, guys, who knows? I mean, I've been working this 46 years, and I have all my theories, but I don't know, <laughs> you know, we haven't had really big space wars to see. And again, looking at the uh, attitude, um, the Air Force develops, um, Warfighting Doctrine and Maxwell Air Force Base in Alabama. And I talked to the Colonel once and I said, hey, you know, I got all this doctrine for space war and all that. It's coming down the line. You want it? It's free. Here, take it. And they says, no, we only do doctrine from past wars. We don't do doctrine for future wars. So in other words, we have to lose a war in order to learn our lessons. Now we'll know better next time. That was the attitude. Maybe that's different now. I don't know. All right, well, thank you everyone for all the questions and thank you again, Mr. Szymanski for providing us with those insights on space warfare. Um, our next panel will be at 1130 and it will be on challenges to security in space. In the chat, there will be links to the next panel as well as the IGL website with all the conference info. So again, thank you for attending and we'll see you then. Thank you. <laughs>